Okay. Welcome back, party people. We are deep in the Lophotrochozoans. So we're going to continue our seemingly eternal quest through the protostomes. So we're in Phylum Annelida. And just to review where we were in the last lecture, we were going through the segmented worms and we went through class polychaeta. All right, and so now we are arriving at the Clitalata. So Clitalata is a class, so Kingdom Phylum class, right? Phylum Annelida, class Clitalata. We're still in the Lophotrochozoans, so the trochophore larva, all right, is one way to remember um, an important distinction of these this group. And we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the Lophophore in a moment when we talk more about other um, Lophotrochozoans, such as the Bryozoans and the Brachiopods. So, all right, well, the Bryozoans in particular. So, class Calidolata consists of the earthworms and the leeches, all right? And the earthworms are collectively known as the Elegachita. So, here, let me, actually, I'm skipping forward just to show you. So, Elegachita, here, so oligo is a prefix that means few, and then kita is that bristles, right? Or hairs. So <clears throat> few hairs. And you may look at this earthworm and go, earthworms are not that hairy. Well, actually, if you dissect an earthworm and you look really closely, or if you just pick up an earthworm and you look really closely, put it in the right light, especially if you, like, you backlight it. I know that's that's your project. Go backlight it. Go find an earthworm and <laughs> find this find the seti. Um, but, so they are oligochaetes, all right? And earthworms, oligochaetes, you have oligochaetes that obviously live in the soil, but there are oligochaetes who are also um, aquatic, just so you know. So uh, important characteristics of the earthworms. They do not have parapodia. As you, as you can see here, there are no parapodia as you see in the polychaetes. They don't have a well-differentiated head, but typically you can tell the anterior, re anterior region of the animal because of the clitellum. And that clitellum is this structure here, which is important for reproduction. And so that's the anterior end of the animal. We're closer to the clitellum. All right, they have very few keti, that's oligochaeta, right? They are hermaphroditic, meaning that they have both male and female uh, reproductive organs, but they still, will cross fertilize, meaning that they will still engage in um, sexual activity to swap gametes. So here you see, and they form a mucus cocoon. Here you see two beautiful earthworms engaged in a loving embrace. So this is actually how earthworms, these are actually earthworms mating, if you just want to get real with it. So you see they line up and there are, you have structures here, Near, above the clitellum, but they line up over each other's clitella um, to, to mate, All right? So those are the earthworms. And I'm going to post a video, a really fun video that I've mentioned before about earthworms in Schoology. I'll probably just post a link in the updates. That's what I'll do. It's pretty fun. All right, so let's move on to um, other the other members well-known of the class Clitellata are the leeches. The leeches actually also have a clitellum. It's just harder to tell where it's at, but it's there. And these guys are, of course, segmented worms. So here you do have the clitellum on the leech, but it's, it's tough to see. And most of you are probably familiar with the difference between a leech and an earthworm, but in case you're not, leeches have suckers on their body, whereas earthworms, oligochaetes do not, all right? So these leeches, uh, they're typically freshwater, but there are terrestrial leeches in tropical area, um, and you can find leeches in, yeah, terrestrial um, and tropical areas, mainly freshwater though, and freshwater leeches, I find them oftentimes in streams, um, and they are flat little buddies. They're, the way that they move is really interesting. Um, sometimes the, if you get a really small leech, 
you might mistake it for a planaria, except that the, the leech doesn't have that little triangle head of a planarian, of course, um, and it has suckers. And if you watch it, it'll, you'll see the sucking happening, like it's sucking around. And you're like, oh, that's clearly a leech, not a, not a flower. <laughs> but I just, I point that out because that, that's something that you see in the field. Feel free to go looking for leeches. Um, we do not have um, a coelom divided into, it's, it's really reduced. Uh, they do have a coelom, but it's, it's not divided into segments, I guess I should say that, right? And these guys... Um, they are segmented worms, and they do have these segments, so I don't want to confuse you there with that, okay? Um, one interesting thing about leeches is they're very important in medicine. Some of you may already know this, but some of you may not, so we still use them in medicine. They were used during, you know, medieval times, uh, back when, you know, the model of medicine was the four humors, and if you had too much of one of them, then you'd get sick, and if you had too much blood, you could make you sick, and that's not at all, right? It's not real. That's not a real model of the human, um, of human health, the four humors. But they would use leeches to bleed people if they thought they had an overabundance of blood. Interestingly now, that's exactly what we use leeches for, but not based on that model. So post-surgery, if you have post-surgical swelling, um, or if you need to, if you need to keep blood in an area co from coagulating, such as, well, post-surgery, or uh, if somebody's had a limb severed or something like that, an amputation, and I shouldn't just say a limb severed, or an amputation, could be done in a hospital. Leeches are very helpful in those situations because they can reduce swelling, and also when they hook onto you, they produce an anticoagulant to make your blood flow. So they keep blood from clotting when you don't want it to clot. Very cool. So these animals are really helpful to us. Um, and, well, they're also, you know, I guess they're technically parasitic. There are, there are non-parasitic leeches. I should point that out. Those do exist that don't feed on blood, but rather feed on, like, detritus. So just know that is a, that's a thing that exists. Um, also, when a leech attaches to you, I don't know if you've ever had a leech on you, you don't normally notice it because they produce, they also produce an anesthetic that numbs you essentially so that they can and suck your blood and suck your blood. And, and so you really don't really notice them until they drop off of you because you, that anticoagulant makes you bleed. And so you're bleeding and you're like, oh no, but very interesting animals. Obviously, I, I think leeches are really cool. So to compare across the three major classes of annelids. All right, you have the polychaetes, the oligochaetes, and hyrodenia. So that's the leeches, hyrodenia. All right, they don't have any set teeth. So if you were to compare and contrast these animals, you'd see the polychaetes have parapodia, whereas the clitolata do not. And you have, you know, the hyrodenia, the leeches, they don't have set teeth, whereas you have varying amounts of seti among polychaetes versus oligochaetes, and that actually helps you remember that the class um, polychaete, many keti, right? Oligochaete, few keti. And the clitolata have a clitellum used for reproduction. All right, so that's, we're still in the love of trochozoans, but those are the annelids. And now we're gonna be done with the segmented worms, and we're gonna talk about two phyla, uh, particularly of lophophorates, and, uh, and I, you know, it's the bryozoa and brachiopods, and I said particularly the bryozoa just because it's really prominent. The, the lophophore is incredibly prominent in the bryozoa, so you see them in the, like, what you're looking at is the lophophore. So, we're talking about two phyla of mostly marine animals, that's the bryozoa and the brachiopoda, all right? We call them the lophophorates because they have this characteristic lophophore, which is a, it can be a circle or it can be a U-shape. Let me show you. Here, this is the lophophore. It's a structure um, that is basically, it's, it's in, this one's U-shaped. It's a structure that's basically a couple of rows of ciliated tentacles. And that is a special <clears throat> structure. It helps in 
um, obtaining food, filtering in food. And, and um, gas exchange for the animal by increasing surface area because you have all that surface area because you have these tentacles. Okay, so it has a dual a couple of functions. And once again, lovophore, this is a circular or horseshoe shaped um, structure that's made up of rows of ciliated tentacles. Oh, it's right here. I really need to. I just don't like reading slides, you know, and, okay, let's move on. All right, bryozoa. So, fun, funny enough, um, these animals are, the moss animals, they're also called horseshoe worms because the lophophore can be, is horseshoe shaped in many of them. And bryozoa comes from the name, the Latin, it literally means moss animals. And these are truly colonial animals. And when I say truly colonial, I mean like they're a colonial animal. They occur in colonies. And <clears throat> they, they produce this chitinous chamber here, all right? You can see it here. These are the chitinous changers. These are called, and that chitinous chamber is called the zoecium, okay? Uh, and so it has, um, some car calcium carbonate in it, so it's hard. It's, it's essentially a place for the animal to retreat into when needed. Um, and these animals reproduce via budding. So let's look at this. Within the zoecium, you see, you have, it has a, the digestive tract of these animals is U-shaped. So the mouth and the anus are located fairly close to one another, or just adjacent to one another. And a hallmark of these animals is you just, you can see that lophophore, that row of ciliated tentacles here, that again is important for feeding and gas exchange. Let's look at these animals some more. Oh, look! So here we have some horseshoe worms. Okay, here. And so, and here you, you can see that lophophore. A closer look here into the digestive tract and um, there and other well the gonad and um, various organ systems of the animal. So you have a digestive tract here, and you can see the mouth and the anus are close to each other. Mouth, anus, right? And you have the gonad. Though these animals reproduce asexually via budding, um, they do have a gonad though. And um, can they can reproduce, I should say this, they can reproduce sexually. And also you have a nephridium, which is like a, well, you should know this. It is like a what? Kidney, right? Important for filtering metabolic wastes. All right. And that's, that's really it. Those are the horseshoe worms, the bryozoans. All right. Very prominent lophophore in these lophotrochozoans. All right. Let's talk about the brachiopods. Brachiopods are also lophophorates, and these these actually a lot of people mistake these for for bivalves, but they are not bivalves. They're not even in the same phylum. They're their own phylum, Brachiopoda. Okay, they are not in the um, mollusk phylum. Phylum. So they look a little different, and there's some some ways to tell the difference, and this will help you, I guess, more in lab. But they are, and you may hear things now, I think my son is having a Zoom meeting with his class. Um, they're dorsoventrally hinged. And what that means is that the hinge on their shell, so they have a shell similar to a bivalve that, that are hard, um, and they are dorsoventrally hinged. So not laterally hinged like bivalves. Bivalves are laterally hinged. And they have a lophophore, but it is not prominent like you see in the bryozoans because it's actually inside the shells, um, in the body. So what you look at and what you see when you see a brachiopod is that shell, and there's also a pedicle back here, and this is a hallmark that will help you in identifying these organisms. And brachiopods, you know, since that hinge is, you know, dorsal, top and bottom, ventral, as opposed to lateral, which is your back, right? as opposed to lateral, um, horizontal, um, they tend to be, they, they 
it's a this isn't a good way to do it because you can't actually sit there and open the animal, but they tend to be more like they don't open like this, basically. They open like this. Okay. So they look a little bit longer here, and then they have a pedicle coming out of the back of the animal. All right. And that helps them to anchor down. And that's a big way to tell the difference, like tell this is a brachiopod, because they have that pedicle. Okay. Um, yeah, so let's go, we're just gonna go through a little bit. So here um, you have the lophophore of this animal. Again, this is in the shell. All right. And you have their digestive system, you have a stomach, you have a nephridium, just like you do in the bryozoans. So um, detoxifying and, and um, the metabolic waste in the animal. And the main thing, you don't have to know the full internal anatomy of a brachiopod, but I do want you to know that the lophophore is located within the animal. And I did want to make you aware, these animals do have um, a digestive system and, you know, a, an excretory system that allows them to carry out these bodily functions. Because sometimes people look at these animals and they think, wow, it's just so simple. But really, there's, there's a lot going on in there. All right. But that's all you need to know about the bryozoans and the brachiopods. And now we're going to talk about one of my favorite phyla. And I know you're like, is every phylum your favorite phylum, Dodd? Shmaybe. Shmaybe. I love life. What can I say? Okay. Guys, we're leaving the lophotrochozoans. Come with me. Come with me. All right. Come with me. Come with me. And you'll be. In a world of ectosozoa, these are the molting animals that undergo ectosis, which is molting. <laughs> so now we're leaving the sporalia, and we're moving into the ectosozoans. Okay, are you ready? Good. So we're gonna pay special attention. Today, we're going to finish up talking about nematodes, uh, and then in the next lecture, arthropods. Mm, arthropods, I love. So, okay, I'm sorry. I'm taking up so much time, probably. Y'all are like, just get on with the video and teach us the stuff, lady. Look, man, you got the slides, okay? <laughs> you could just read the slides if you want, I guess, but... But I like having someone tell me fun facts about the stuff. Anyway, okay. Nematodes. Look at them. I have a very special place in my heart for nematodes because nematodes were the first organism on which I learned to do research. I named them all George. Anyway, so the nematodes. So the annelids are the segmented worms. Just reviewing here. The bryozoa are the moss animals, Buddhists and brachiopods, <clears throat> those are the lamp shells. These are the round worms. They are not segmented worms, but round worms. And here you have a worm right here. They're tiny. Well, they can be tiny. They can be big. There are, oh my gosh, nematodes. They're everywhere. They are. I think I told you before. If like the soil just disappeared, you would still see that structure of the land outlined in nematodes. Yes, I'm not joking. You can find nematodes pretty much almost everywhere on Earth. Almost every single, and I, maybe even every single plant and animal species that we have ever studied has a parasitic nematode, at least one. So these guys are cool and occupy many niches. They are very diverse. There are 61,000 species of nematodes. That's a lot. And they, you find them in fresh water. You find them in marine habitats. You find them in the soil. I should have soil here. They find them in the soil. They are also terrestrial. Um, they are parasitic, free live and free of free living, of course, if they're marine and freshwater and terrestrial. But they also parasitize a vast array of organisms, plants, animals, you name it. All 
right? And this is just showing you a picture of pork with encysted nematodes. Yum. So you find them everywhere. And if you were to just take, go outside, and I'm not, ooh, if you have a microscope, if you were to go outside and get some soil, I mean, putting the soil under the microscope is going to be hard to do. But if you wash out the soil, right, you could, uh, you will find that there are a bazillion nematodes in that soil. <laughs> bazillion. That is a scientific quantitative term, a bazillion. Okay, so let's talk about characteristics of the nematodes, though. All right, so these are pseudocelomates. So pseudocelomates with, and they have a tough outer cuticle, bilaterally symmetrical, as you can see, and obviously they are not segmented worms, okay? Not segmented. They are roundworms. This is showing you just a cross section of the animal, and you can see they have a very thick cuticle there. It's protective of them. Um, you know, to to get into one of these guys, you got to blast them open with some, you know, some sort of um, agent, some sort of um, reagent. Lots of fun. Anyway, sorry, I'm getting lost. So let's talk about nematode physiology. They do not have a respiratory system because they actually can have, they, and I told you the cuticle is sick, but gas exchange does occur via diffusion across the cuticle. So no respiratory organs. Yep. That's the thing. If you're not finding respiratory organs in an animal, it's you can safely assume that the animal is carrying out respiration, it's carrying out gas exchange um, through simple diffusion across the integumentary surface skin of some sort. Right. Uh, but they do have a digestive, a complete digestive system. So they have a mouth and a pharynx and they kind of like suck things in with that muscular pharynx or like like that. That's exactly how it happens. And as you move down the animal, <clears throat> let us move down the animal. You have. Oh, and this one is male. Here's a testis. You And we know it's male because it has a little hooked in. That's the. Out, what, that's how we can tell on the outside. This is a little male right here. He has that little hook. Okay. He's, and you have spicules on the animal. That's a hallmark of a male nematode. Anyway, so from the pharynx down through the this intestine and then in the anus and the genital pore or down at the posterior end of the animal. <clears throat> Here's in, the animal in cross section. So you've got your cuticle. You have, you've got a dorsal and a ventral nerve cord. So dorsal nerve cord. The ventral nerve cord is up here, right, right there. There it is. Okay. Um, you have your pseudocelum, so it's not all lined in mesoderm. That's a true coelom, right? So you have a pseudocelum, and this is just showing you cross sections. So of this animal in particular, so you have a testis, and um, showing you the intestine here, right? And the main thing. Um, you know, you have males, but um, some of these are hermaphroditic. I should tell you that because your book isn't very, it doesn't really go into that, but you do have um, hermaphroditic nematodes. They eat a wide array of things. As I was telling you, they occupy a number of niches. So, you know, some of them are, some of them are like the Gosh, some of them, it's like dune, and they're like sandworms, and they're eating everything. They're predatory in the soil. Some, some of them are. Um, some of them are detritivores. Some of them are, of course, parasites. You have a wide array of, of feeding modes in these animals. And some of them are equipped with stylets, which are basically kind of um, a needle. They're needle-like structures for feeding. Okay, so that is a stylet, right there. It's a needle-like specialized feeding structure. All right, so talking about reproduction, most are gonochoric. So as I said, some are hermaphroditic, but we focus at least in your book here on the gonochoric nematodes that um, exhibit se sexual dimorphism. So you have males and females, so that means gonochoric, right? That's what gonochoric means. 
And sexual dimorphism means that you can you can look at the animals and you can say oh, that animal is a male animal, that animal is a biologically female animal, and there you have it. So to tell nematodes apart, particularly we do this in the lab with Ascaris limbricoides, which is a parasitic nematode. And so the males are smaller and they have a little hooked tail. So I showed you in that picture before. Let's go back to it. Little hooked tail right there. Okay. And, and I, I'm sure you saw this in the lab with Dr. Jones when she did her lab video. Uh, you have internal fertilization of the animal. And <clears throat> in the animal moves from egg to larvae through onto adult. And just to show you... Um, you know, some important anatomy to know. In the male, obviously you're going to have a testis. These guys have spicules that help them in attaching to and um, copulating with the female. Okay. In the female, of course, you're going to have a uterus, an, an ovary, and they actually have a vulva. That is uh, the outer, the outside, the outer uh, reproductive structures of the female, just like just like those of you who have vulvas now. You and nematodes, we and nematodes, we got vulvas. Ha, oh, I'm putting this on the internet. Okay, so we know though, it's biologically true. I love biology. Okay, so like I said, some of them are big time hunters. You, some of them, if you are a soil protist or a soil, well, small soil animal, anybody, and you come upon, and there's, and you hear, oh no, it's coming. Nematodes! Right? They will eat you! Some of them will. And remember, there's 61,000 species, so there's a huge diversity of these animals. Right? So some of them, hunters, predatory. Some of them, parasitic. This is, um, this is showing you Soil nematodes parasitizing potato roots. This is a huge area of agricultural research. Um, one of my family members is actually, or she was, um, she worked for a lab, I think it was a U of A lab, that worked on basically ways to control nematode parasitism of, of crops because it can be a big issue. If you've ever grown a garden, you may have had issues with soil nematodes because soil nematodes can parasitize plants, and particularly the roots themselves. And that's no good, because you know why the roots are so important, right? For nutrition, for water, for sugars, and, new, and micronutrients, right? So here you see parasitic nematodes in plants. All right, and some live in animals. And we're going to go through some right now that live in humans. So prepare to be grossed out if you get grossed out. If you're, some of you are, I know are like pre-vet, it's like, hope you don't, you better not get grossed out. You better practice not being grossed out. <laughs> so, a lot of parasitic nematodes. Um, the largest parasitic nematode is actually a nine meter long nematode that parasitizes the placenta of sperm whales. Here you have them here, placenta nema. Yum. All right, so let's talk about some of these. They're pretty fun. And... And so we're going to talk about this because, you know, those of you who, sorry, I had to adjust my sitting. Those of you who can go on, most of the ways that people encounter nematodes, unless you're a farmer or a heavy duty gardener, which you might want to learn to grow food. Just don't throw that in there. Just throw it, throw it in there. Plant seed. Um, most of the ways that people encounter nematodes, though, are via human disease. So we'll talk about that. The first, you have um, you have hookworms. So here's the thing. I'm just giving you an overview of these. And um, this is just for your information. I do want you to be aware of some of these nematode diseases uh, and have a rough familiarity with them. Say, oh, hookworms, yes. They all, they all have a lot of things in common, like producing many, many, many eggs. Um, and some of their ways that they infect humans are similar. So just know that if you're like, how am I going to keep these all straight? I'm, I'm mainly just te teaching you this to have an overview so I could say, hey, tell me some of the nematode diseases that are, you know, 
that are an issue with the human population, and you could you could talk about them. Okay. So the hookworms are actually not too terribly uncommon, um, and and you see them. Uh, they were really common, I want to say like in farming communities, because what happens is the nematode penetrates the skin and then the, the uh, adults infect the, the intestine, okay? And then the eggs, since the, the nematode infects the intestine, the eggs come out in the feces. And you don't have to know, you don't have to know the filiform larvae and their abditiform larvae, okay? I'm just, these are just various larval stages that hatch and they're typically in soil, a lot of this you find the larva or the eggs are in soil. And again, the larva can penetrate the skin and that infection cycle continues. Um, but they do, they move through various parts of the body before they reach the intestine. I, I should mention that. So they move through through the skin, right? And through the down the trachea, it's actually like, through the trachea and the lungs down into the intestine. Uh, and it's particularly in the lungs, the alveoli. So, um, usually these guys produce, well, they do thousands, tens of thousands of eggs per day. So when you have an infection, and here you see an infection, you have a large number of eggs being released. And that makes sense because you see this complex life cycle that involves being inside of the host and outside of the host. And so you, it's a risky life cycle. So you produce lots and lots of eggs. Okay. And particularly, like I said, you see this, like farm kids get it, like people who go around without um, barefoot. That's, that's what I was trying to think of. I was like, farming kids, I was farming kids. Because my um, grandparents would talk about people getting hookworms. Um, or hearing about hookworms. So if you walk around barefoot a lot, I actually walked around barefoot a lot when I was younger and, and I was, when I was in my, you know, teens and twenties and people would be like, you're going to get hookworms. And I'm like, what? I didn't get hookworms. I didn't get hookworms. So it's fine. But yeah, so hookworms, one disease. Um, so, oh, actually, hold on. Freaking yellow. Eh. So um, this is a pork. I'm sorry. This is a this is a disease that comes from pork. And basically, what's happening is these um, nematodes insist in the muscle of pigs. And so, if you were to eat undercooked pork, you can you can end up with this disease. Where and it's it's like an intestinal. Um, intestinal infection so most people like well okay most people get it from eating undercooked pork if you eat undercooked bear that is actually one of the modes of transition it's in it's a real thing so you ingest it and that insisted larva moves into the intestine you see these mostly intestinal issues intestinal infections right that then insist in the muscle um, and this causes you know, diarrhea, abdominal issues, uh, muscle pains, there's there's a systemic response to it. So obviously when this kind of thing happens, people end up going to the doctor. This is true of all of these. People end up going to the doctor because you notice something is wrong, right? So that is trichinella. Whipworm. Whipworm um, is mostly a tropical disease. And so these two, these are pretty common. Um, trichinella not as common uh, around here that you do it does happen it's just most of the time people are cooking their pork well but it can happen um, whipworm here you have an infection you can see and it's, it's called a whipworm because it has this whipped in um, and it's the third most common nematode disease in humans nematode parasitic nematode it causes um, again, intestinal issues, diarrhea, um, weight loss. It can actually stunt growth. So whipworm is not something we see in temperate areas around here, but it is a problem in tropical parts of the world. 
in words. Mm. So <laughs> I, should I tell the world this? My brother had pinworms when, and it's actually incredibly common. Um, this is the most common. It infects, they infect 11% of the population and mostly children. And interestingly, there's a higher prevalence in white kids. Hmm. So um, these pinworms are found in temperate areas. And you get it from a couple of ways. You can get it from if the, if the eggs are in soil, but oftentimes you get it from children pass it to each other. Like they're always touching their hands, right? And so if they have things on their hands, they can ingest the eggs. Um, but you can also get them from ingesting food that has the eggs in them. That's where we think my brother probably got them because he was in high school, like high school. This is, these are, these are especially prevalent in children, but um, it can affect people of any age. And the hallmark of pinworms is, so they're in your intestine, you notice a theme here, and they cause, so at night, the females will crawl out, um, like go through the rectum, and they'll crawl out to the anus to lay their eggs. So it causes severe anal itching. And so, like I said, I have a personal experience with somebody who has had pinworms. I told the whole school and he beat the ever loving crap out of me. But hey, I mean, that was mean, right? I was, I was, a, I was a kid. I wouldn't do that now. But um, I mean, I am telling you, but he, he won't care. Um, so, I mean, he, he passed away, so he doesn't care. Anyway, so, um, but Jake, he, we were in high school and he, we think he got it from eating something. Because there's, I mean, we just didn't know where they came from, but that's what he thought. Because we ate some questionable things when I was in high school. That's a whole other story that has nothing to do with biology. But, um, yeah, so he was having serious issues with anal itching. Not kidding. And it was really bothering him. And he was like, something is wrong with me. And our grandmother um, came to visit one day to check on us. And she, she was like, he might be like, check on you. Yeah. Again, long story. And Jake was like, grandma, something's wrong with me. And she was, she, she basically got it out of him. But he was basically, he was like, I need to see a doctor because my bottom itch is so much. I think something is wrong with me. So, um, she took him to the doctor and he had pinworms. Very easy to treat. Um, you take a, a, he took a medication. There are anti nematode, anti, um, yeah, particularly anti nematode, anti worm, dewormers essentially, are what you're taking. And yeah, he was fine. No more worms. But I did get the crap beat out of me. So, and I, I, I probably deserved it because that wasn't nice to tell the whole school that my brother had worms. But I couldn't pass up the opportunity because he did terrorize me as a child. So, Anyway, professional help is being sought. Okay, so just showing you the cycle here. Again, going through here. So they, it, it's just like you see a common theme. So this is what I want you to know and remember is this common theme. You have part of the life cycle in the host, part of the life cycle in the external environment, and that is why they release so many eggs is because they have a very, they have a very um, risky life cycle. I call it a risky life cycle. It's a high risk situation for the animal. So if they didn't produce lots of, have potential young, lots of young, then the animal wouldn't continue. It's a very smart, and I mean, not like life history strategies are smart, but it is a successful life history strategy. Okay. And the reason that the female um, goes to um, the anus again is because the oxygen is needed for maturation. So she can't lay the eggs in the intestine. So that's why she has to go to the anus. All right, let's talk about Aspirus. Aspirus lumbricoides is also incredibly common. And it is, a, again, an around worm of the intestine. This is found um, primarily in areas that do not have good modern plumbing or sanitation. But it, like I said, super duper common. 
and they can clog up the intestines actually and cause very serious illness. Um, you tend to have intestinal distress associated with these animals, with an infection of these animals. And I think I've shown you before, but here you see a resected bowel of a person who has had um, a severe ascaris infection. Oof, that, that looks like it hurt. Yeah, so um, very common. And these animals produce tons of eggs per day. They can live for a long time in the soil. So again, you have that life cycle of within the host. And again, these animals migrate from various parts of the body. All right, they're taken in, taken in, they go through the pharynx. And, and just like with other nematodes, they move through the trachea, not the esophagus, the trachea. So they're not moving directly from the digestive tract. I want to make that clear because sometimes that's unclear to people. They think that you're, you know, you're just, you're just swallowing them. Um, and just swallowing them is, a, it can um, lead to an infection, but usually it's through inhalation. They get into your pharynx and then you inhale them and they get into your lungs and through the alveoli and to the bloodstream. And then they migrate to the um, intestine, but you can't ingestion, ingest them. Okay. Cool. <laughs> oh, yes, but they can survive for a long time in soil. So that's why, like, that is why these are particularly an issue because they can persist for so long. Okay, um, so uh, filarioidia, filarial nematodes. These are the the organisms responsible for a lot of tropical parasitic diseases. And I'm only giving you a small, a small sample of this. There are a lot of parasitic nematode species um, and filarial worms. Like your book talks about a few, Brugia malayi is one that I'm familiar with. Um, and they cause, and so you have, here's this, here's the style of the animal. So they're in, they infect, various parts of the body and cause inflammation. They cause um, filar filariasis is basically infection with these filarial worms. Elephantiasis is a pretty, um, hey River, is a pretty serious condition where the, the filarial worm is carried via some other vector. So mosquitoes or black flies that bite you and you're infected with the worm. Though there are, like I said, a number of ways these animals can infect you. That's one way with these filarial tropical worms. Um, and this is elephantiasis. So what happened is in these infections, the, the worms infect the, the lymph system and basically clog up the lymph nodes. And the lymph system is important in your body for you know, draining of lymph fluid, right? Um, so your body becomes, the lymph nodes become full of these nematodes, and so you basically swell because of the buildup of lymph. So you have this elephantiasis. It causes the limbs to become very large and elephant-like, which is where the name comes from. And these, these infections can be fatal if left untreated because you... You're, you um, your body needs you, your body needs a fully functioning lymph system, but also they can cause other issues with other organ systems. So they can lead to fatality if you don't treat them. And most of these nematode and diseases um, and these nematode infections can be prevented by simple hand hygiene, because a lot of the time um, you you can get them just from you know inhaling a lot of dirt. If you work in a farm in like the agricultural industry. You're at a higher risk potentially, but in and especially in areas that lack good sanitation. But by and large, practicing good hand hygiene, which is important right now anyway, is one way to reduce the transmission and incidence of some of these um, diseases. Also, fully cooking, ensuring that all of the meat you eat, if you eat meat, is fully cooked, fully cooked. That prevents a whole host of issues. Um, from nematodes to tapeworms, right? Which are not nematodes, of course. They're flatworms. But 
proper hygiene and ensuring that you are handling things that could be infected in the right way can prevent a host of problems. So that's all I want to talk about with nematodes today. We're not done with nematodes. Um, we are going to talk a little bit about some of the other organisms that they parasitize to finish them up. But I, I'm already I'm at 45 minutes and I don't really want to keep you any longer. So this is for Friday, Friday, April 17th. Um, and so there is an optional quiz today that will be due by midnight. You do not have to take it if you don't want to. It's optional only because some folks really wanted those points. Um, so if you take it, those 20 points, it's not bonus points. It's just whatever grade you make, that's it says that you did all five quizzes. OK, but if you don't take it, you are not penalized. It just it doesn't even become a part of your grade. So just know that. Um, and so next week we will finish up with the nematodes and start on arthropods, my favorite thing in the world. Okay, let me know if you have questions and I will see you soon.